people overestimate what AI can do for them in the short run, and we think they're underestimating what it can do for them in the long run. And right now, at least in marketing, everyone's using it for content creation. Content creation, mm -hmm. AI is just creating a lot of regurgitated content uh, on the tech side, video side, nothing amazing that we've really seen at scale. Uh, and images, nothing amazing, again, that we've seen at scale that you know can get you a lot of traction. For bringing in more business, we don't look at social media as a tool to bring in business. We look at social media as branding and getting our name out there so that when people are interested in our services, they know about us. The best way to bring in business is just provide amazing results, uh, do great work, have a great product or service. And the second way is get your brand out there. And I'm a big believer in SEO and paid ads and email marketing and omni-channel marketing. And all this helps build a brand. But at the end of the day, what people tend to forget is when someone is interested in something like shoes, you know, a lot of times they just go to Nike because they know Nike or when they want a car, they may just think Tesla. Let's kick off, man. I've been following your work for quite some time and I'm really looking forward to getting to this, right? And the biggest thing I observed from you is the fact that in your early days, you were always surrounded by like entrepreneurs when you were growing up. How much was that a big influence in where you are now and the decision to go build multiple companies? Never plan on building multiple companies or anything like that. Um, just, just more so the overall goal was to make money. And when I was 16, I don't necessarily have the idea that I want to be an entrepreneur or anything like that. I just want to make mm. money. And I was a little too young to get any one of those high paying jobs. And I was inexperienced as well. So the only real so, route that was available was entrepreneurship. But from there you went on to build like, you know, many different companies as well. So how was that kind of development for you? So you went on to your first like even tech company and then you've gone on to build your agency so how come you keep in the game and you keep moving on to more to more and bigger things uh i used to do too many businesses a lot of it because one didn't work out so you hop to the next one or you have another idea and you have add some of it it was businesses were working out spitting off good cash i was like oh i can use the cash to do more businesses and I just lost the concept of focus and not really lost it. I never had the concept of focus. And over the years, I learned that if you just focus and do one thing really, really well, you'll do better off in the long run. And eventually I started focusing and I spent all my time these days on my ad agency, NP Digital. And uh, the focus has done really well for us. When do you go deep versus diversifying? So you're saying like, you know, you're cash flow positive, you had a good bit of money coming in and then you're building new ideas. Do you think that there's a lot of merit to sticking with one idea for multiple years versus going off and, and not knee shopping, but trying different things continuously? There's no right or wrong approach. Um, you know, when you talk about niching, the problem with niching is, is if you're not going after a big time, you're not going to do really well. And I always tell people to be an entrepreneur, whether it's in a niche or a big, broad market, it's probably the same effort. So might as well go after a big, broad market. Uh, you, you can niche down at the beginning, but make sure you eventually expand into a big TAM. If you don't expand into big TAM, which stands for total addressable market, uh, you won't do that well. It's hard to capture 50% of a million dollar market versus capturing 0.01% of a you know $10 billion market. And then for you, with your, with your ad agency and with your agency now, was that going after all of the ad agency market and then niching into enterprise? That's how you're thinking about it. No, uh, for us, it was mainly we went after all ad agency related services, specifically focusing on digital, because we see that as a future. And mm -hmm. we were working on any type of accounts when we first started. That would, as bad as it may sound, that would pretty much pay us, right? When you're starting off as an entrepreneur, sometimes you can't be picky about the type of revenue that you close. And I'm not saying the customers are working with were bad or anything like that. And I'm really appreciative of all the companies that have ever hired us. Uh, it's more so you got to find where you can produce the best results in and what's the ideal fit for you. And for us, it was enterprise. Uh, so we focus majority of our time on enterprise these days. It was just a how come you, you can't just hop into it from day one. Or how many years has it been for that? 
Yeah, uh, so we've been around for more than five years, but uh, the first year, a lot of SMBs and then slowly bigger and bigger companies. And, uh, you know, I would say like two, three years ago, majority have been enterprises since then. How come um, you focused on the agency when you've had tech companies too? I heard you mention on my first million, they were they were speaking back to you saying, oh, like, you know, tech companies are way more scalable. And you were saying, look, cash flow is cash flow, right? It's all about, make, it's all about making money at the end of the day. How come you actually were working on an agency as well as having other companies in, in the tech space? Yeah, so some of the other companies were past. Uh, agency is the most current. And the reason I focused on the agency is that that's where I saw the opportunity. You know, if I had the option to create HubSpot and have that scalable company, don't get me wrong, I would pick that first. But I, I think <laughs> it is a little too late for me there. And congrats to Brian and Darmesh for all their success at HubSpot. And I'm not mm -hmm. saying agencies are better than scalable software companies. I think so scalable software companies are better. It's just the camp I'm in. It's where I saw the opportunity mm -hmm. and I'm going after it and I love it and I'm having fun doing it. I heard you mention about, you know, leaning into your strengths and leaning into what works for you. How important is that for like first time founders, for people who are getting pulled in different directions to build a SaaS company, to do this and to do this? Like, how do you focus on, how do you find your strengths for like a young entrepreneur? So you typically find your strengths by trial and error. You, you do a handful of stuff. Some things work out, some things don't. You figure that you like some things, you hate other things. And typically the stuff you like and the stuff that works is typically the stuff you're good at and the stuff you enjoy. And that's what you focus on. And then you hire for everyone else who can fill in the gaps. Hard to do that at the beginning, uh, but you learn a lot of that through trial and error. And it's okay not to be great at everything. When I was a little kid, mm -hmm. my you know, parents, my mom really didn't say this to me, but parents typically would say, you can do everything. You can be whatever you want to be. And uh, you don't need to be a jack of all traits. You're better off just focusing and being really good at one thing. What was that for you though? Because you famously hire continuously and you're like hiring, you're hiring a CEO, you, you replace yourself pretty quickly. Now that in itself is a skill. Something I'm definitely even struggling with is even the ability to hire and fill gaps. So what is it a skill that you were able to bring into those different roles? Yeah, so uh, let's go back with you saying you're struggling to replace. What are you looking to replace? You're, you're um, day to day higher. management, you know, uh, subject matter expertise, for instance, like if the background that I have will be uh, very specialized in the podcast space. And then as a result, to bring someone in and in to replace that will be sometimes quite difficult. Now, of course, I'm working on it and I'm hiring as a result, but it's like, the years that I've put into this is difficult to, to find someone to replace that. So look for other people who have a lot of experience in podcasting, worked at either in the networks, help scale up other podcasts or grow them or who understand the business and were in operations. Look for people who also worked in other agencies that specialize in podcasting and look to see those individuals who got promoted. And if someone worked mm -hmm. at two places in similar industries and they got promoted, multiple times, it means that other people found them valuable. Those are the ones you should interview. Mm. And that's what exactly been your kind of thesis to building as a result. Yes. Interview other people who have done it before. Easiest way to grow. That's not. What type of um, revenue are you guys working with at the moment in your tech company and your media company? I suppose you're doing multiple different things. You do 17, maybe 20 ventures. Uh, no, 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 no. We just had the ad agency. Um, mm -hmm. but revenue of customers varies a lot. You know, we work with mm -hmm. customers that are doing millions and we have some customers that are, you know, doing tens and tens and tens of billions in annual revenue. So for the, for the, um, the companies that you've built, have you actually, do you still have equity in those? So a couple of the earlier stages, is that, is that how you're still staying in them or are they actually sold off to other people? Uh, some of them have shut down. Some of them have sold off. Uh, some of them I have equity. It varies on the company, but um, I just still spend all my time on the ad agency, NP Digital. Nice, nice. And then that's where all the growth comes from, and that's where you can start acquiring other different companies. Correct. Awesome. I want to get into different aspects of, uh, of marketing. And of course, I think now in July, going into August, when this is released, we've obviously seen like impact of like AI and how it can be uh -huh. used helpful or can be pulled back or how we can leverage it. How, how are you thinking about using it in your, in your agency? And like, is it something that 
how are you approaching this? The, the big thing we look at AI is, is people overestimate what AI can do for them in the short run. And we think they're underestimating what it can do for them in the long run. And right now, at least in marketing, everyone's using it for content creation. Content creation, mm -hmm. AI is just creating a lot of regurgitated content uh, on the tech side, video side, nothing amazing that we've really seen at scale. Uh, and images, nothing amazing, again, that we've seen at scale that you know can get you a lot of traction. We're, we're seeing AI more useful in areas that not too many markers are really focusing. For example, people have data in so many different places. How about having the AI help you analyze the data and create actionable insights from your analytics? Because most companies, A, don't log into the analytics, and B, when they do log in, they're not taking action on the data. So using mm -hmm. AI for things like that, uh, we're seeing as much more powerful as, hey, let's uh, have it write a blog post that we could have paid someone five, ten, twenty, hundred dollars for whatever the amount may be. So you think the focus is on the wrong area, basically, whereby like they're using it for ad copy or they're using it for SEO, and as a result, it's it's it, not it's, being effective. It, it's not the wrong areas. It's there's mm -hmm. better, more efficient areas. I do think it could be useful to create a thousand variations of an ad, but you know, figuring out objections people have uh, and why they may be interested in a product or services like uh, yours will give you much more insights and typically from what we've tested, provide a better ROI than just creating a random thousand variations of ad. All right, people, we're just going to take one short little break for a little update about Podcast University. So if you enjoy podcasts like this and you want to start your own podcast, head down to the links down below to Podcast University. This is a learning platform that I've built to help people like you build, launch, and scale your own podcast. I wasted many years doing this, making it all up as, a lot, as I go. So I put everything together in a very seamless and, and easy to follow course for you guys to follow and just learn exactly how to do it. So if you want to bypass a lot of the mess with your podcast, check out the links down below to Podcast University and it will show you exactly how to launch and scale your own podcast. Yeah, and I think the experience that you have, for instance, in creating ads or your team would have is the fact that you've done it so much, you're really understanding your ICP, you're understanding exactly who you're writing it to. So it's better than something generic or generative at that point is because it's just, you're <laughs> able to tap in exactly yes. and be able to test it, right? Because you've yes. X amount of data points that you have and maybe you could use AI to aggregate that data and be able to show it something clearly, but it's yeah. not like you need it to get to the end point. So it, you're, to a great point, like it's like the split focus as a result, going back to it, or focus on the wrong things with this. That That's at least what I think, right? Other people may disagree mm -hmm. with me, but um, I think we focus on a lot of the wrong stuff with AI. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential, but it's just using it in places that can make you more productive. Like, for example, did you know mm -hmm. over $160 billion a year is being spent on Google ads? Like, just think about that, $160 plus billion. Imagine if the AI in real time helped people save more money on their ads. You know how much money that would save? More than people writing content. How would that work? Like, how would it save money on ads? Uh, analyze your analytics and data in real time and tell you where there's wastage in ad spend. And not necessarily- So you wouldn't be burning. Data, send it to a human. Human can review it and decide what they want to do. Interesting, interesting. And then if you're, if you're looking at AI for the future, then where are you looking to potentially integrate into your business beyond analytics? Is there any other aspect that you think it might be effective? Like content creation is a good point, right? Because you have ghostwriters that are using it and it's just, it's coming out with trash or it's coming on LinkedIn. It's very like generative posts on LinkedIn or social media. Are you trying to stay away from it on that and focus on different areas? Well, uh, a few ways. Analytics is one, having it come up with content ideas and topics and uh, helping you start the content creation process another than you have a human take over it. Uh, another one is uh, setting rules within the AI and having a uh, automatically tweak and modify code where there's issues. Another one is creating tools. Uh, it took ChatGPT around 60 seconds to create the game of Pong. Uh, tools and uh, games are a great way to get backlinks and notoriety, and you can do quite a bit of that with AI as well. You just may need a developer to look at it at the end. But there's a lot of areas like that that you can use AI for, which is great. Um, you can help create a lot of different variations of ads. Uh, we talked about that earlier. That's, again, if you can give better input on what you're looking for based on objections and then have it create variations and maybe not a 1,000, but like 50 or 100, 
uh, that's great. Or when you're doing creatives for companies, you know, like when you're doing a photo shoot or a video shoot, like we've done some creative campaigns for brands, uh, you can use AI to just swap out a lot of stuff and it just uh, reduces the time to create some of the creatives or campaigns. How will it impact um, different aspects of like SEO? So you're a big dude on SEO and, you know, you're probably very close to this. If we flood with a lot, flood the internet with more information um, to do it, like AI generated content, how would that impact SEO? You just have more pages, but do a search for anything. So check this out. Yeah. We're doing an interview right now, okay? And I'm going to do a search on my computer screen right now for the word auto insurance. All right, auto insurance, according to my screen right here, search 301,000 times per month. All right, do you want to guess how many results there are for auto insurance? Say a million, two million. A million, two million? Let's check mm -hmm. this out. Not even. So I'm sharing my screen. Look at this, 301,000 results out of 3.6 billion. Most people oh the paid ads or page one, and that's really it. And then you go to page two and that's, you know, very few people click on that and page three and even less. So, but basically 30 out of 3 billion results are getting almost all the traffic with only 300,000 searches a month. The point I'm getting at is they're already good at drowning out the noise, creating AI mm -hmm. and just creating a ton of junk content is not going to do anything. Searchings already know how to drown it out. How do you prepare for that? So when you're writing SEO, like what is it you're mainly focused on? So to make sure that, okay, out of this auto insurance, you are the one that's going to be on page one because the best place to hide a dead body is on page two, right? That's right. <laughs> uh, so to get on page one, you have to create something that's unique. You have to leverage E as Google calls it, experience, expertise, authority, and trust. That makes your content more unique. You got to build links. You got to have your page loading fast, you have to have the experience great. What I mean experience great is, you know, let, let's say I'm trying to rank for how to tie a tie. All right. Mm -hmm. Decent amount of searches, 450,000 a month. Now, most people who search for how to tie a tie don't want to read a thousand word articles written by AI. Look at this. All right. Gives you different tie options, maybe a little bit of text, some images, and that's it. I was like, okay, let's do a four, hand, four in hand video that shows you not size, symmetry, difficulty, breaks down how to do a step one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And that's really it. Bow tie. Here's how to tie it. You know, like this is mm -hmm. basic. But, um, you know, uh, let's say, you know, the current president, Biden, okay? If you want to rank for Biden or Biden related stuff, you're probably going to compete with government sites, JoeBiden.com, Wikipedia. You may need a lot mm -hmm. of content. You know, there's a lot of history for the president. Doesn't matter if you like it mm -hmm. or hate it, hate him. You know, I'm not trying to get political here. That's a mute point. So like click on the Wikipedia article, same thing. You see tons and tons of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you see this tab, you see tons and yep. tons of content on Trump. And then or the hill, which also ranks, you know, it's linking to all the latest articles on Trump. Um, and of course, within them, you're going to find a lot of text, right per article. So all I'm getting at is, for some queries, you need a lot of text. For some queries, like how to tie a tie, no one cares to read a lot of text. If I want to type the what's the weather in Los Angeles, California, no one cares to read a 1000 words. If I want to type in what's two plus two, People just want the answer of four. They don't want to read a thousand mm. words before they find out that the answer is four. You need to make things very contextual. So you don't need to go to 5,000 words unless you, unless you really need to, right? Exactly. What I love about your approach towards marketing is that you have a real 360 view that you're an OG in the SEO ad space, but then you've also dominated like the social media space and some people sometimes can be quite entrenched right they're like oh we just do this but yours is like very omni-channel where do you put most of your time on for your own personal um social media is it linkedin is it instagram is it youtube because you really have hit it from all different angles uh, we we use all of them we believe in the omni-channel approach uh did you know the average social media users on 6.6 .6 social networks roughly as of june 2023 mm -hmm. um so 
you can't be on one. You got to be on multiple platforms. That's how you reach people. Whether you like LinkedIn or whether you like Treads or Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, doesn't matter. Use any platform that your ideal customers are on and repurpose the content, and then you'll get a lot more play. Did you niche down on a particular one in the beginning, like master one, get to your first 100K followers, and then move on? Or like, how did you approach that? Because they're all different to some degree, right? Yes, but people shouldn't use that. They should use that strategy, but they shouldn't follow which ones I first joined. Because when I first started, most of these social networks didn't exist. So yeah. now you just pick the one that's most relevant for you, uh, get it down really well, and then start repurposing your content and going after the other networks. How are you thinking about platforms like LinkedIn at the moment? So LinkedIn is obviously some like drop in engagement has happened, but of course, like you have people that are continuously posting. Like I posted on LinkedIn every day for three years and it's been the biggest lever for my business more than so than anything else. Um, and I still just push through it. Right. But LinkedIn are doing a couple of different things in the back end. So do you still have your own strategy, your own approach, bringing in more business? For, for bringing in more business, we don't look at social media as the tool to bring in business. We look at social media as branding and getting our name out there so that when people are interested in our services, they know about us. We look mm -hmm. at um, the best way to bring in business is just provide amazing results, uh, do great work, have a great product or service. And the second way is get your brand out there. And I'm a big believer in SEO and paid ads and email marketing and omni-channel marketing. But at the end of the, and all this helps build a brand, but at the end of the day, what people tend to forget is when someone is interested in something like shoes, you know, a lot of times they just go to Nike because they know Nike or when they want a car, they may just think Tesla. So for example here, so if I type in Nike here, mm -hmm. I go worldwide, I go 2004 to present. They've been around for ages. I type in shoes. I understand the word shoes is not what people use in every single country. Like in Latin America, a lot of people say zapatos. But look how powerful and big Nike's brand is, right? More people mm -hmm. are searching for Nike than shoes on a global basis. It's kind of crazy. That's how you really build a big business. You create a brand. You create a brand by leveraging omni-channel marketing, participating in all channels, building a great product and service, uh, caring about your customers, and really going above and beyond to delight them. That's awesome, man, because you think people are getting too focused on like just building a social channel and that's it versus focus on the actual product and service, which is what it's all about, right? Everyone sells sells and marketing, but no one talks about fulfillment, but that's basically how you're going to build it, right? Exactly. That's awesome, man. So when you're looking at, let's say different platforms like Instagram, LinkedIn, how do you treat the content? Because some people have very different content across platforms and that's something even I've been, I guess, sometimes victim of, but do you keep things very consistent and you repurpose them through video, through text, through tweets? How does that work? So we try video, we try text, we try audio. And what we do is we just test on different platforms and whatever works best is what we do for that platform. And whatever doesn't work, we don't do for that platform. And we do the same mm -hmm. approach for most platforms and go from there. Sometimes you can repurpose like on Instagram and TikTok. Sometimes you can use a lot of the same content. Uh, some platforms like LinkedIn and Instagram, you got to create different content and rotate it up because the platforms are just too different. Yeah. What do you think about the, the audience as a result? Because I think that sometimes like on LinkedIn, people are there to buy or you're at least you're at that, you know, C-level um, executive kind of like target market are going to on LinkedIn versus on Instagram is a little bit different, right? It's kind of younger. They're less really attracted towards like buying straight away or, or even, or even following. So like, how do you think about that kind of audience? Yeah. So, uh, the audiences are different and we believe in the omni-channel approach and we believe social media helps a lot with top of funnel. Uh, we mm -hmm. don't worry which network's going to be better for customers or not. We just look for which ones have our ideal users and customers on them. And we participate and interact and engage and get to know them. Uh, and that's what we focus on because keep in mind, we work with enterprises. So our sales cycle is really long, but on a flip yeah. side, if I'm a consumer based company, I would actually just measure the ROI and see which ones are driving a ton of sales. If I'm selling like toothpaste or something for like a dollar, $2 or five bucks or whatever it is, and then just mm -hmm. focus my time and energy on whatever's driving the highest ROI. All right, guys, one short little update for Voix. I want to give a short little overview about my own company, my media company called Voix. So if you are a company or you are an enterprise looking to grow your brand and looking to grow your podcast, 
feel free to reach out to work with us at Voix. What we do is a fully fledged end-to-end management of your podcast. We take care of the strategy, the consulting. We take care of the growth, the management. We take care of all the editing, all the boring stuff so you can focus on creating good podcasts and create and growing your brand. If you want to grow your podcast and get to new users, if you want to grow your business, generate more revenue and all that good stuff, check out the links down below to Voix. You can follow through to schedule a call with our team or else you can fill out the application form to see if you qualify to work with us. Thank you. That's interesting because that's something quite similar to me, obviously not on the scale that you're at, but it's like, you know, working with SNB enterprise clients, I'm not going to find those on Instagram, right? So are you trying to drive just mainly the brand or are you just trying to find like uh, drive newsletter subscribers? What's the, what's it's, the objective, I guess, as well as everything that? drive the brand, drive newsletter yeah. subscribers. Cause that also drives a brand drive podcast listeners. Yeah. Cause that drives a brand more blog post readers. Cause again, drives a brand. More followers, because again, that drives a brand. More leads, because that drives revenue, right? It's a little bit of everything. Over time, I guess you you you're able to hone that craft. You know, you don't necessarily sell through those platforms as well. In terms of like your call to actions aren't to come by or to book a call, which is very nice. It's the fact that you're just building a brand, and that's it. Yeah, um, th- that's right. Well, sometimes we do have call to actions. It's not just building your brand. We try to sell at the same time. So we do the brand, okay. we try to sell, but majority of it is to build a brand and then some of it is to generate sales. Before we finish up, I want to ask you about those CTAs. So what are CTAs we can use in platforms like LinkedIn or Instagram? Like what is it we're trying, how should we write these? So you can create educational content and help people out. So for example, like in your industry, you can teach people how they can do podcasting better. And they'd be like, by the way, if you just want us to do it for you, click here and set up a call and uh, we can discuss helping you out. So what you want to do is educate and then tie your call to action to be related to what they just learned. It's like if I wrote something on SEO and here's how to get more traffic from Google without paying for ads. By the way, if you just want my team to do this for you and break down what you know you need to do step by step, click here to set up a call. Awesome, man. Neil, I want to say a massive thank you. Short, concise, and I want to say I really appreciate your insights, man. And uh, yeah, man, anything I can ever do for you, always feel free to reach out. Sounds good. Thanks for having me.